Today, we travel to Mexico City. Mexico is known for its beautiful crystal blue ocean water and beaches. And in Mexico City, canals run through the city, with mountains surrounding the city from every side. Mexico City comes alive with its vibrant colors. But in the year of 2007, a great darkness was spreading across the land as residents would soon learn about serial killer and cannibal Jose Luis Calva Zapeta. Zapeta. Listen, people, I don't speak Spanish. I'm sorry, people from Mexico or that speak Spanish. This is not going to be as act, so I apologize. Then came details straight out of a Halloween horror movie. Come join me, Holly, in the murder she shed where we honor the dead right from my she shed. But this is Halloween, so instead we are telling crime stories. Well, it was supposed to be in front of the campfire, but I was a wuss tonight. Maybe a chicken. My husband's not home, and I didn't want to sit out in the woods with the campfire with him not at home. Plus, it was cold, and my she shed's warm, so I'm making up for it with my she shed electric fireplace. So enjoy. Voila, we have a fire. So join me as we discuss the true crime story of Jose Zapata. He was born on June 20th, 1969. Jose's childhood was traumatic. His father died when he was only two, and his mother used to bring men to his home whom the boy had to call dad. His mom, Eli Zapata, is a dominating woman who imposed a regimen of harsh discipline throughout his boyhood. In January 1975, the then six-year-old Jose stumbled up on a light and his oldest sister in the room of the family home as they were setting out gifts for a Mexican post-Christmas children's holiday known as the Three Wise Men. Eli smacked Jose and shattered the toy she had bought him as a punishment. He ran out of the house and began shining shoes in the neighborhood just to save up enough money to buy him a daggum new toy truck as a replacement gift for himself. When he came home, Eli grilled Jose about the little truck. And upon learning how her son had obtained the truck, she flew into a rage and beat him again and destroyed the newly purchased toy. What is she wanting to steal it? Because that, good Lord, the poor boy worked for this. It should have been a positive thing. He worked his butt off to get a new one. When he was seven, he was RAP'd by a 16-year-old friend of his older brother. Soon after that, he ran away from home and spent time on the streets just begging, stealing, and prostituting himself to pedophiles. That does not sound fun. I think I'd rather let my mom beat me over a toy before I do that personally. But teach is on route. Even with all of this, he still managed to finish school and grew a love for writing and poetry. He met the woman who would become his wife and mother of two of his children in 1996. They divorced only seven years later, and she moved to the U.S. with her daughters. He sank into a deep depression. Just like Jeffrey Dahmer, he did not enjoy solitude and felt that no one would stay in his life and love him like he deserved. And you know what Jeffrey Dahmer did when that happened. As his loneliness and depression grew, He threw himself into his dark writings and also began to drink alcohol heavily and became a coke user, not drinker, user people. During this time, he wrote poetry such as Requiem for a Lost Soul and Cannibal Instincts. Jose began to sell his poetry at the city's informal markets. He also unsuccessfully tried to sell his scripts to be used in horror movies. Then in 2007, he met a single mother named Alejandro Jolinia Lenia. Let's just say Alejandra. Okay? Leave it at that. Or Blondie, as her family called her. She worked at a local pharmacy. After the first couple of months with Alejandra, Jose was completely obsessed over her. Jose charmed her with gifts, flowers, 
and love poems. I love poems, but I don't want my husband write me any. Maybe that's just too sappy for me. No, I'll pass on that. Flowers and gifts are good, and that's it. Alejandra brought Jose home one Sunday afternoon to meet her family over lunch. Alejandra's new beau struck her mother as creepy, eager to please on the one hand and too much into himself on the other hand. He would brag to her family that he was a poet, a playwright, a director, and a singer. He said he earned $200 a day selling his written work. Her mother was not impressed. Everything seemed to be all about Jose. Soon, Alejandra would see his true side too, but unfortunately, this would end her life. Alejandra was transferred to a different pharmacy located on the northern neighborhood in Mexico City, which was a good distance from where Jose lived. So she figured this was a perfect time to break up with him. Afterwards, she received repeated phone calls from Jose threatening to kill himself. On the afternoon of Friday, October 5th, Alejandra failed to show up for her regular work shift. Alejandra's mother had a bad feeling that Jose was holding her daughter hostage, but could not in her worst nightmares imagine what had truly occurred. When police forced their way into Jose's apartment, he was sitting at the table eating some meat seasoned with lemons. When he seen authorities enter, Jose tried to jump from his balcony to a neighbor's balcony, lost his grip, and fell, injuring his head. Jose was taken to the hospital while the search of his apartment began. Police say that inside one bedroom closet was Alejandra's dismembered cadaver, minus the right forearm and the right leg below the knee. The missing limbs turned up inside the refrigerator in the kitchen, where investigators also discovered a cornflakes box containing a bone covered in muscle tissue that had apparently been fried. A place setting on the kitchen table held a plate with bits of fried meat and other pieces of flesh and fat were found in a frying pan atop the stove. Alongside some chunks of the victim's flesh was half a lemon, raising the possibility that Jose had sprinkled the victim's forearm with the fruit's tangy juice before eating it. So crudely was her body hacked up that an officer commented that it appeared as if she had been run over by a combine harvester. The police found an unfinished novel titled Cannibal Instincts that bore on its cover page a masked image of Hannibal Lecter, the man-eating killer of Silence of the Lance. The book cover had been altered to resemble Jose's face, so he cut out old Hannibal and inserted his face. His video collection included the Silence of the Lambs sequel, Hannibal and a French flick called Cannibal Blood. Never heard of it. He also has a collection of knives and machetes, books on witchcraft and sadism, and a collection of animal porn videos. That freaked me out the most. I don't know why. I can handle the eating people, but the animal porn videos? Uh, uh. No, no, just no. Authorities said... Then under interrogation, Jose said he accidentally choked Alejandra to death during an altercation on the evening of October 5th. But investigators said they found a pair of sneaker shoelaces that Jose allegedly used to strangle her. Though he was prepared a little, he had some shoelaces ready. Just slipped them right out of his tennis shoes, I guess. He also denied having consumed any portions of of her corpse, and according to the police, spoke instead of a plan to get rid of it over time by feeding cooked parts of her body to stray dogs in the inner city neighborhood. Y'all, but the dude had the meat lemon herd flavored and on a dinner plate, unless these stray dogs were going to be invited into his house and pull up a chair to his dinner table and eat some lemon flavored meat, well, then the dude is a liar. 
Later, he was said to have committed two more murders and maybe up to eight total, although that couldn't be proved. In April 2007, it was thought that he had murdered a prostitute whose mule body was found in a suitcase near Jose's flat. Also, the 2004 murder of his then-girlfriend, Veronica Martinez Cazaruba, whose severed head and mutilated body were found in two cardboard boxes in a working-class suburb of Mexico City. The police arrested a former friend of Jose's named Juan Carlos Monroy Perez, who told the authorities in 2004 that he had been the murder suspect's homosexual lover at one time. Mexican investigators said Monroy was a co-worker of Veronica Martinez and that he had introduced her to Jose. Monroy had been picked up on charges of being an accomplice to the murder of Veronica. He has told police that it was Jose who killed the divorced mother of three and then hacked her to pieces in April 2004 and that he played no part in the slang. That's what I'd say to Monroy. That's what I'd say, too. Jose would never have to do much time for the murders because he killed himself pre-trial. The prolific writer was found hanging by his belt from the roof of his holding cell, and he didn't even bother to write a suicide note. All right, that's it for Halloween. I hope you ghosts and goblins have an amazing weekend. Love y'all. See ya. Bye. Oh, it's got a freaking mess going on. Look at it. Just keep... Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, 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 big boy. It's not that kind of YouTube show. Today, oh my gosh. Oh, God dang. As usual, I'm having a great time. Hello, my people, my wonderful people. Open them heels. I'm already 11 minutes in and hasn't said dog crap. Zapita. Zapita. I'll just say something. Then came details straight out of a Halloween. 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 Discuss the true crime story of Jose Zapeta. Zapeta. Not drinker, user people. Not a good thing. So he cut out old Hannibal and inserted his face. I'm not sure how he did that when Hannibal's got a mask on. Isn't he the one that has the mask on? I think. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's the other guy. There was No, that was the other one. Hannibal is the one with the mask, right? Oh, forget it. A former friend of Jose's named Juan Carlos Monroy Perez. Why do y'all have such long nights? I mean, three's plenty. Although I can't say nothing. My mom gave me four, two. Why am I speaking like that? She literally gave me four. I don't know what's wrong with the woman. Now me and Buddy gonna go to bed. We're sleeping in the she shed tonight, my little Buddy boy. The other two are, I didn't want all three in here. And Buddy's the nicest. The other two are in the house. And Buddy's out here with me. They guard the house. They're fine with that. Simon's too hyper. Max is too hyper. But my little buddy, he is the sweetest dog ever. I don't talk about him much. He's old. He's like 10 years old. A big boy. He's the, my true love, the one I fell in love with the first time. And I love him so much. And he's already in bed sleeping. And I think I might join him. So I'll show you buddy sleeping over here. Boo-boo. 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 Bo